Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> That's, a, That's what it feels like. What's up, Joe? No. Oh, okay. Welcome to Wednesday night service. Let's all stand for prayer. Brother Stephen, will you open up prayer? couple of people that want to get anointed so let's let's do that now Joe and who was the other one Mr. East, Mr. East? yeah let's come on up Brother, Brother Wooten would you come up too please Reverend Wooten would you come up too please Father, we bless thee tonight. We thank thee. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord. We thank you for the blessed souls, Lord, who have come forward. And blessed Father, we're asking for healing, Lord. Thy word tells us, Lord, you've, you've healed many, Lord. You've given eyes to the blind, Lord. You've given legs to the lame, Lord. You've raised the death into life, Lord. Oh, blessed Father, we're asking, Lord, that you will touch Daniel tonight, Lord. Touch him in a mighty way. Let him receive all that you have for him tonight by the way of healing, Lord. And we'll give thee the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' masterful name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. All right. It's time for. Greg is going to lead us in some songs tonight. Greg? That was a quick and easy way to, uh, you know, good half hour. No, I got him fixed. Yeah, yeah you know how we do. <laughs> Joe, now that you've been anointed, I want to hear your voice tonight. This is my first time. I won't do as good as Sister Rhonda or as good as Brother Short, but I'll do my best. The glory of God. <laughs> Song four sixty nine.
Number 256. Good singing tonight. Pretty good. 
nice and loud. That's good. That's a good thing. We won't have any prayer requests tonight. So, yeah, I was just about to say we need to remember Sister Foster and, and her family for losing her daughter yesterday. Christina's son has COVID. Rhonda? I have a question on Holy Spirit too. I know I have work related issues. So we pray. Okay. You might think anybody at works has got some of those. So we, <laughs> we pray that for everybody. <laughs> Doug? Sir. I want the Reverend to uh, pray for a good friend of mine, Terry, who's not in the United States here, but thank you for praying for him. God bless him. Okay. Yeah. Gino? I'd like to pray for the Reverend. Uh, God yes. still be with them. I, I see with them. Uh, just to pray for them that they're going to get better. Okay. Amen. <coughs> Stephen? For the Lord to be with our friend Miss Price and help her. Amen. Black? My wife. Your wife. Okay. All right. Anybody else want prayer? Mr. Cassine? Okay. All right. Amen. Yes, sir, Mr. Eldridge. Okay. All right. Amen. Jonathan? Well, we got the nation of Colombia and the Colombian people um, for protecting probably uh, mass Catholic like yourself and your prayer and many thousands of people trying to take that away from the world. Okay. Doug? All right, let's stand for prayer. Joe, would you lead us in prayer, please?
Okay, can I have ushers, please? Again, this, this offering goes to uh, Brother Goodman and his mission to Guatemala. And every time, you know, every time I think about Guatemala and I think about those commercials that I used to see on TV about Africa and South America, and they would take it and fly it all the way to the map and the coast and the poor country. Help you to give them is we ought to give them. Amen. Doug, would you lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to give to that ministry and your glory. We just ask that uh, to you first and that trust in you originally, that we back to you. We bless those over there and help them to minister to your people in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Greg's going to come lead us in another song. Yes, Greg. Yes, ma'am. Greg, Greg's already got a song. They worked it out with the piano player, but we, we can sing it sometime. That's one of our favorites. Yep. All right. Greg? Uh, I remember on my birthday, nobody knew anything. I was getting by. I was like, oh, this is nice. No one knows anything. And then it just happened to be Will's birthday, and they was going to sing for Will. Will got said, what about Greg? Greg birthday too. Greg, stand up. It's your birthday. I said, thank you, Will. <laughs> 
So I was happy to see everybody else after that get prayed for. So Brother Doug, would you please stand? turn to, oh, before we do that, I just want to say before, I want to thank everybody for singing along and worshiping and making it as easy as possible for me. When Reverend Wooten told me, Greg, was giving an assignment, Greg, you're going to be doing, you're going to be doing worship. I said, ah, that's real fun. He said, no, I'm serious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to turn to page 607. Just a closer walk with me. Patsy Klein and Willie Nelson do a good job, but we do it better. I, I really enjoy the way we sing it here. It's slower and more mellow and good and loud. I, I, I love that song. Yeah. All right, it's time for Brother McFarland to bring our message tonight.
as, as we were singing the last hymn, I noticed uh, some of the lyrics, and it stated, Jesus, keep me <clears throat> from all wrong. And I pray every day, and I thank Jesus for keeping me from places and things I should not be, doing things I should not do. And Jesus has been very faithful in keeping me from those things. And I thank him. I thank him for it. And uh, I, I, I just want to say it is, it is so wonderful that when it's your turn to, to preach or to teach, how God would orchestrate put things in order. And uh, as, I'm, as I'm standing here right now, I'm thinking about the, the discipleship class and, 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 and all the things that that entails and, and what we're trying to do to teach you and to bring you closer to what Jesus has for each and every one of us. And my, my message tonight is Jesus is going to be teaching discipleship. If I didn't do an adequate enough job or if Greg isn't doing an adequate enough job, I know Jesus Amen. will do a great job. <laughs> And I think Jesus is the best teacher ever. Amen. The best teacher ever. And, uh, he's going to say it the way you can understand it. You may not receive it, but you understand it. And I thank God for it. I thank God for it. So if you would be so kind, uh, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 9. The book of Luke, chapter 9, beginning at verse 57. The book of Luke, chapter 9. Verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home in my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Praise God. Praise God. Most gracious Father, we thank Thee. We thank Thee for this time, Lord. We thank Thee for this moment, for this opportunity. We thank You, Father, for each and every soul present tonight, Lord. We invite Thy help, Thy presence tonight, Lord. 
We're reaching out to you, Father. Touch and bless this unworthy servant tonight, Lord. Grant me understanding, Lord. Touch and bless each and every one of us. And for all that's accomplished, Father, we give thee the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' masterful name, amen, amen. and amen. So tonight's passage speaks about three men who, who Jesus met as he traveled with his disciples. Two of these men declared that they wished to follow Jesus, to become his disciples. The other was called to follow Jesus. So the first thing I notice in this passage is that Jesus encountered three men. Each one has a different level of commitment, and each one receives a different response. So that lets us know Jesus speaks to each and every one of us differently. The first man I would call an opportunist. And, and, and I would suspect that we might have a couple opportunists in our congregation tonight. Verses 57 and 58. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So as I, as I look at that and as I meditate on that and as I, I, I read others concerning this particular uh, uh, verses, this man seems to be more interested in what he can get out of a relationship than what he needs to put into a relationship. He has high expectations. He expected to get an easy life by following Jesus. I mean, if Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, should not there be the good life that goes along with it? Many people think by following Jesus, life would be easy. In some respects, it is. But folks, let me tell you a truth. Following Jesus can be hard. There is a cost involved. That is why Jesus tells him the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So I will say to you, if there's any of you out there right now that is ashamed to say that you reside at the Fort Myers Rescue Mission, you need to be rebuked. Because the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. But the Son of Man gave you a place to lay your head. Praise God, praise God. Have you considered the cost? Have you considered what it is going to take to follow Jesus? Jesus could have talked about a mansion over the hilltop, but he didn't. He could have talked about the streets of gold, but he didn't. He could have talked about eternal life with no more sorrow. No more pain, no more crying, but he didn't. And do you know why? It's because before there is a crown, there is always a cross. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God, praise God. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross daily. Praise God. That's exactly what that means. 
Jesus took up his cross. And if you're going to follow Jesus, we must take up our cross. That's not to leave something behind. Everything has to be nailed to the cross. Everything has to be sacrificed. Everything has to come under the blood. Everything. So let me, uh, let me take you to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, verse 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall. Inherit eternal life. In this verse, he gives us a promise. We shall receive a hundredfold. We shall inherit eternal life. But notice what happens first. First, there is the leaving. Then there is the receiving. First, there is sacrifice. Then there is reward. It cannot be any other way. This is the truth that we need to understand. This is the truth we need to consider. There is a cost when you follow Jesus. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere. To lay his head. And I'm like everybody else. I like my home. I love my little garden. I like my lawn. I like my recliner. I like my flat screen TV. I like my kitchen. My comfortable bed. I loved it all. And I was grateful, grateful that God gave me that. But I hope and pray, I hope and pray that with all the stuff that God has given me, that I would not be unwilling to give it up if he called on me to give it up. That's exactly what that means. That we own nothing. We don't have ownership of nothing. All of this belongs to God. The place you pay rent ain't yours. I'm, I am willing to give it all up just to get closer to Jesus. And we sang tonight, just a closer walk with Jesus. To have that closer walk with Jesus, there are some things we have to be willing to give up your heart, your life, your mind, your body, your soul, and above all, your will, your will. Praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. We can stay in Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew 10. Matthew 10, verses 38 and 39. Matthew 10, 38 and 39. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth 
his life for my sake shall find it. So what verse 39 is telling us? If you love this earthly life so much that you're not willing to give it, you're not willing to surrender it to Jesus, you will lose that life. But Jesus is saying, when you die, it's done. You're done. You're done. But Jesus says, if you're willing to lose your life for my name's sake, when this old earthen body does decay away, Jesus says, over the, the other shore, over the kingdom shore, I will be standing. I will receive you. I will receive you. Yeah, you can hold on to your life all you want to, but no, there's a cost. <laughs> there's a cost. There's a cost. We need to be committed. We need to count the cost. Then we need to follow him. The second person is a hesitator. Verses 59 and 60. 59 and 60. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. I know a bunch of you thinking, oh, man, that don't sound too. That's not an unreasonable request that I should go and bury my father. Should Jesus not been given permission to go and bury his father? Should he not go and be with his grieving relatives? Should he not go and take care of his family responsibilities? Surely no one would be so harsh to say, you can't go. Let the dead bury the dead. But that is what Jesus said. Yeah. To be honest, this is one of those hard passages. We must do some interpretation here. And, and, and when I say interpretation, I'm talking about some educated speculation here. Some further readings. So here we go. Some commentators tell us that it is unlikely that the man's father was dead at this point. In fact, he in all possibility was not even sick. But in the culture of that day, when a person dies, he was buried the same day. There was no hesitation. There was no waiting around. When death came, the burial proceeded quickly. So in all probability, the father was not even sick, or the son would have already been at his side. What he was likely said to Jesus was, I want to follow you, but first, I need to go home and work and wait until my father dies. Then I will come and follow you. So oftentimes, especially if he was the eldest son, he was to receive the inheritance. And if he wasn't there, But in that culture, fathers and sons had a special bond because they carry forward the name. They carry forward their skills, their occupation. So that puts this verse in a whole different perspective. Will the son wait for a week? How about a month, a year or two? How long would it be before the father dies? And how important is following Jesus in the meantime? The pastor does not say, yes, I will follow you right now. No, it doesn't say that. He says, permit me to go. 
permit me to go. These are words from someone who is not ready to make a commitment. Lord, let me do this first, then I will follow you. He was not willing to do it. And if he did, and if he didn't, then it was probably wasn't going to happen at all. And I, and, 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 and I liken it to, I've been here some, I don't know, 13, 14 years. And I've heard many of residents say, I'll come to Jesus when I'm ready. I'm not ready yet. You will never be ready. You will never be ready to come to Jesus. What you're saying, when you get tired of all your sinning, then you will come to Jesus. But a man that is in his sin, as a natural man, cannot stop sinning. That is who you are. The only time a natural man even considers stop sinning is when the Spirit of God convicts you of your sin. At that point, you are ready to come to Jesus. God first has to put his finger on something to get your attention. Then you are ready. I'm not pointing at you, young fellow. <laughs> I've gotten that from Brother Wooten. <laughs> then you are ready to come to Jesus. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. What is more important than proclaiming the kingdom of God? There is nothing on God's green earth more important than proclaiming the kingdom of God. For this man and for us, it is a crucial moment of decision in our lives. It was a moment that would define the rest of his life. It was a point where the decision he made would determine the road he would travel. Jesus simply laid it out plain. Do you want to follow me or do you want to go home? And wait for a more convenient time. And you know, all of us, at some point or another, could have hesitated. But there comes a time. There comes a time when you must make a choice. Amen. The opportunity may not appear again. Choose quickly, choose wisely, choose Jesus. The third person we're going to look at is the procrastinator. And I'm going to tell you, that used to be me. I will delay everything I can for as long as I can. You know what? I want to I want to I want to backtrack before that is put on official record. I still procrastinate when it comes to the hospital and getting needles. I will I will put off an appointment time after time if it could be done. So so I still do it. Oh, uh, don't be scared. <laughs> That's easy for you to say. Walk in my shoe and you tell me that same sentiment. Okay. All right. All right. 
All right, verses uh, 61 and 62. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. In our culture, we love lots of things. We love Jesus. We love our family. We love sports. We love pizza. We love our dog. We love our hobbies. Not so much cats. (laughs) We love our lifestyle. But do all these loves have equal value? equal weight I should say not Jesus wants to have first place with our love notice again what the procrastinator says I will follow you Lord but first I too always came up with but but first I always found something else to do to delay that thing I didn't want to do. Always found an avenue out. Always. But let's go to Matthew 10. Let's go to Matthew 10. Matthew 10, looking at verses 37 and 37 through 39. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Let me read that again. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So what Jesus is saying to all of us tonight, I must be first in your love. I must be your first love. I must be your first love. Why? Because he first loved me. Praise God. When you marry, your husband or your wife should be your first love on earth. That's what marriage is. A union. A joining. You're one. You're one love. Jesus and the Father was one love. So Jesus did not blow off his own family ties. One of the last things Jesus did before he died was entrust the care of his mother to his friend John. Jesus is not anti-family. Jesus is not a cult leader who would have his followers reject and disown their families. So what was Jesus getting at? Jesus wants us to love him first, to follow him, to serve him. Now, this is not the first time in the Bible that someone was called, but first they wished to say goodbye to his family before they set off to follow God's leading. I'm going to turn over to 1 uh, to Kings. 1 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings chapter 4. I think 1 Kings is before 2 Kings, correct? 1 <laughs> Kings chapter 19. 
And, 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 and what we have here is the prophet Elijah. Uh, the prophet Elijah saw Elisha plowing the field, doing his, his duties, his responsibility. Elijah went up to Elisha and threw his cloak upon Elisha. And Elijah kept going. And that culture, placing your cloak upon another person's shoulders, meant that that person was passing the torch to his successor. Elijah was to follow Elijah and learn to be a prophet and to eventually take the place of Elijah as the new prophet of Israel. So Elijah left his oxen standing in the field and, and chased after Elijah and said, and he left the oxen and ran after Elisha and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, go back again, for what have I done to thee? So what Elijah told him, Go back, kiss your parents, but don't you forget about what I have just done to you. You need to make an important decision. You need to choose. Think about that really hard. Jesus said, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. That also takes me back to, to, to Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, come on. When Lot and his family was fleeing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they were specifically told, do not, do not look back. And the first time Lot's wife got an opportunity to clear the city gate, she looked back. She did not inherit the kingdom of God. Direct disobedience. Direct disobedience. Done. So when Jesus talked about plowing and looking back, everyone understood what he was talking about. If you want a straight row, you don't look behind you. You look ahead. If you're going to follow Jesus, you must move forward, not backward. You can't stay in place. You can't look to your left. You can't look to your right. You look forward. And the easiest way to do that, Rodney understands that, Dane understands that, the, the guys that take care of the lawns understand that. But you get in your car, look to your left, and where's your car going? You look to your right, where's your car going? Wherever you look, that's where you're going. And if you're looking back, that's where you're going, backwards. But Jesus brought a radical message to the world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Doesn't, we, doesn't he have the right to ask our total commitment to him? Jesus must be first, top priority, even higher than our dearest friends, our most precious family members. If Jesus may not ask us to literally leave family responsibilities behind, yet in certain situations, we may have to make that difficult choice. Where any friend or family member tries to become more important to us than God, we must make that hard decision. Either God is top priority 
or we're just playing games with religion. Jesus calls us to follow him, to commit to him completely. Jesus said to the first man, count your cause. Jesus said to the second man, leave it behind. Jesus said to the third man, don't look back. What is Jesus saying to you? Let's stand. So if you're considering being a disciple of Jesus Christ, you first must count the cost. Leave that world behind you. And don't look back. That was the very thing that got the Jews in trouble when they left Egypt. They kept looking back to Egypt. They missed the things of Egypt. And Egypt is symbolic of sin. So if the, if the Spirit of God has spoken to anyone's hearts tonight concerning your place, your place, come now, come now, give your life to Jesus, give your life to Jesus. I don't know what it takes, but I do know Whatever you're thirsting after on this earth, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. There's a verse in the Bible that tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things you're struggling so hard to achieve. He says. They shall. They shall be added. Unto you. So what God is telling us in that. You don't have to work so hard. Let me do the work. You focus on me. You focus on me. And I will give you. I will provide for you. I will take care of you. I will protect you. In your quiet time tonight, get along with Jesus. And ask Jesus to help you. Make that hard choice. To make that choice to live. And to have life. And to have it more abundantly. Praise God. And having life more abundantly, we're talking about spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings, that's the abundance of life. That will get you across the ocean. That'll get you to God's kingdom shore. Spiritual blessing, spiritual abundance. Those that know the power of prayer, let's come up to the altar and, and, and pray with this one that is here at the altar. And I will give a closing prayer. And those that desire to exit, leave as quietly as you possibly can. Most gracious Father, we bless thee tonight. We thank thee. We thank thee for thy help tonight, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that you've granted me, Lord, to, to speak thy word, Lord. And blessed Father, for those that are come to the altar prayer tonight, Lord, we're asking, Lord, that you'll bless and touch them in a mighty way, Lord. Continue to touch the hearts and minds of those, Lord, that are still standing, Lord. Be with them, Lord, as they prepare themselves for slumber, Lord. Shaking their hearts and shaking their minds, Lord. We're so grateful and thankful for what you do, Lord. Be with us throughout this night, Lord. Awaken us afresh and anew. Desiring to seek thy face and only your face. In Jesus' masterful name.
Amen and amen.